So uh, my name is Mitch Bainwall with the Brunswick Group, and uh, it's my privilege to be here today with two superstars from the Republican Party. Uh, I'm going to do a very quick uh, intro of our two guests, and then I'm going to make a couple points about the backdrop, and then we'll get into questions. So I'll try to be expeditious here. So starting with Senator Graham, uh, elected to the House in 1994, a big Republican year, the tsunami of 94 after five decades of uh, minority status in the House. Uh, elected to the Senate in 2002, was a JAG officer before the House, and was in the Air Force Reserves until, what, like five years ago? 2015. 2015. Uh, and Lindsey Graham is, as you well know, has a, a nose for, the, for everything that matters in Washington. He's in the center of every storm, and I can't wait to hear what he has to say in a few minutes. Uh, Morgan Ortegas is uh, a Bainwall family friend, so thanks for being here. The mother of Adina, who's going to be four in November, uh, and a very well-regarded national security expert who um, has a radio show, is on TV frequently, and uh, in a future Republican administration will be a very prominent voice in foreign policy. Uh, so that's uh, the intro. Let me do a quick setup. I'm going to make uh, several points. Uh, the first is, and I just saw the video. The first relates to the video. It's just the, what's happened in terms of industrial capacity and the sale, the production of vehicles in the US versus what's happened in China over the last 20 years. And so in, in 2000, I think I got my numbers straight here. China produced 2 million vehicles. In 2022, they produced 27 million vehicles. 32% uh, of all vehicles produced globally. The US. 12 million in 2000, 10 million in 2022, and roughly 12% of, of um, all vehicles produced in the, US, in, in, the, in the globe. So there's been a massive transformation in just where cars are being built. And so that matters. Now that's before we get to electric vehicles. And uh, obviously uh, we know that China, between supply chains and technology has some advantages. It's one of the reasons why we're all here today and yesterday. And so the, the context for moving forward is one that uh, certainly draws into question what our role, the US role, the Western role is going to be in the production of, of the vehicles and transportation in the future. Uh, there's no question also that the pivot to electrification started years ago. Tesla was founded, I think, in 2003. The S came out in 2012. Uh, GM with the Volt and the Volt and even the Mach-E from Ford was prior to uh, the Biden administration. But the Biden administration certainly has accelerated the pace of change here. So that's the backdrop. And I think maybe the first question should be, and I'll ask uh, Senator Graham to go first and then Morgan, um, is it okay for China to dominate this way? Is there something, how do we feel about it? What do we do about it? Well, no, it's not okay. Um, so we're talking about the electrification of the car, right? Now, why are we doing this? Well, there's a mandate to make electric cars, and I think if Trump wins, which I hope he does, I think he'll, he'll assault the mandate. He'll say, I'm not against electric cars, I'm against a mandate. Whether that happens or not, I don't know. But some of us believe the electric vehicle is good for the environment. How many of you believe that? Okay. How many of you believe the electric vehicle is good for national security? Well, you're both right. So why don't we do this? But you just can't put all of your chips in one basket. Uh, if you want alternative clean energy on the transportation side, you need to look at hydrogen, just not EVs. So look at what China's done. They've gone from zero to 9% of the European market. The reason they're not doing it here is because of 25% tariff. Does it matter if China makes all the electric cars in the world? Hell yeah, it matters. Does it matter if every car we buy is made in China electric vehicle, yeah, I think there's a national security concern. The people that wire these things, they can be roving spies. I don't want to get overly paranoid here, but we need to think this thing through, right? So I'm all in in the EV space. I want to help the environment. I want to get less dependent on um, uh, foreign sources of oil from people who hate our guts. But you're going to have the internal combustion engine for, for a while to come. I like hybrids, but I'd like to make this transition. I think what you'll see with Trump is changing some of the mandates and let uh, the market have more of a say in this. But at the end of the day, it is inevitable 
that the electric car is going to be the dominant way to drive in the next 50 years because of consumer demand, because the car companies want to get in this space and have a lower carbon economy, it is coming as to China. If we don't keep these tariffs in place, then they will own the market here. They're talking about building a plant in Mexico. That gives you the benefit of the USMCA. So China cheats. China's up to no good. I don't want to enrich China until they change. They're a competitor, but we have to deal with a world uh, where China um, exists, finally. There's no production facilities really in the United States when it comes to batteries. South Carolina is becoming a battery manufacturing state. China dominates that market. What good have we done to wean ourselves off fossil fuels in the hands of people who hate our guts, only to go to an electric vehicle where China dominates the entire assembly and production of batteries? To me, that is a national security imperative to break that cycle. Morgan, all you. Yeah, I think that the there's two different ways to look at it. First of all, the mandate point is really important. Uh, there are just, there's, and this is historic throughout the United States, we just don't like being told what to do by our government, right? It's, it's all the way back to our founding. Uh, you can even look at, you know, the pandemic in the early 1900s, uh, obviously in COVID, you know, Americans just don't like the federal government telling them what to do and what they must uh, purchase. And so it's not that people won't be interested in hybrids or electric vehicles, but I just think the mandates don't actually work, and I think they're counterproductive. Um, I mean, listen, when it comes to technology writ large for cars, it, I, I think people will be open to it uh, in the Republican Party in red states if they don't feel like it's being forced down their throat. But the more you mandate, the more you get into a psychology of people that, that, that think, well, if the government's telling me I have to do it, then I'm definitely not going to buy it. I mean, when I look at, you know, it's not just electric, electric vehicles. When I look at driverless cars and the future of driving in general, I think it's exciting. I'm a terrible driver. I was the one person who moved to Saudi Arabia and was thrilled that women couldn't drive at the time. Um, <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. Good. Lighten it up a little. Uh, no, but I'm actually quite serious. Um, I lived there in 2010 and 11. I'm like, I can't drive. I get a driver. This is great. So I do think even people on the right like me can embrace technology, but I, I, I would passionately disagree with some of my Democratic colleagues that mandating and regulating and forcing Americans into it is, is going to be good for consumer choice. From a national security perspective, I, I'm not an automobile expert, you know, by any means, but I can speak from the perspective of how we looked at China in the first Trump administration in which I was his spokesperson for his foreign policy. And ergo, I have an idea for how we would look at China in a second Trump administration if that were to happen. Um, remember that every my former boss, Mike Pompeo, said this once, and I think it's a great way to think about how various administrations frame their policy. In the, in the, in the Biden administration, uh, their North Star, the way that they frame all of their policies, is in the context of climate change. So when they're looking at the inevitable trade-off decisions that every administration has to make when it comes to China, just for example, or any other country, you're looking at, will I make a trade-off decision uh, and try to get climate change concessions from China, or will I get them to make human rights concessions, for example, on Xinjiang. Um, those are real world trade-offs that this administration and every administration has to make. So climate change is their North Star. In the Trump administration, we looked at the context of all of our foreign policy decisions of what was best for America, what was best for Americans. We thought about uh, the Midwestern um, steel worker. Uh, we thought about farmers. We thought about the forgotten people that we felt like Republican and Democratic administrations for 30 years in Washington had for, had forgotten about. So when we look at China, we look at it holistically. So it's not just that electric vehicles, and we could go into this, coming from China, uh, EVs have a ton of security concerns that a lot of people in this room would know about. But if we if we switch to mandating electric vehicles in the United States that force our automobile manufacturers to be dependent on China from a supply chain perspective, that's just a national security imperative that we would never tolerate in a second Trump administration. Perfect. Uh, so I'm reflecting the North Star for, the, for Democrats and left is climate. The North Star for this panel, and Republicans generally, <laughs> is uh, a combination of national security and energy security. 
And the irony of all of this is that all these North Stars are accommodated by having the industrial capacity in the U.S. to, to do it on our own. Uh, so we all have a common objective, and, and that raises this question in a world where, where we've gone from Trump to Biden, maybe back to Trump, and we tend to flip administrations, and we have policies that go zag, zag left and then zag right. Is there a foundation to accommodate all these North Stars that is a bipartisan deal where Republicans get permitting, exploration, drilling, kind of an all of the above. Democrats maybe get incentives or not mandates, but incentives for production and maybe even consumption. Is there a place to go where everybody says, we're in on something that's good for America? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, so I'm, I'm on legislation to do border adjusted tariffs for people who produce products not using sound environmental practices. You know, if you're competing with China and India, you know, the Chinese basically pay the power bill of the steel company. So if you want to get people to move toward a lower carbon economy, you got to deal with China and India. We got to force them basically to change their business practices. So a border adjustive tariff uh, is possible. We got Democrat and Republican support. The Europeans do this. But the Achilles heel of the electric vehicle is power production. What would happen tomorrow? If, if every car on the road, half of them became electric, you'd shut down all the power plants. We're going to have to dramatically increase generation if you're going to electrify the vehicle. Now, how do you do that, being environmentally sound? If you take nuclear power off the table, you can't get there from here. If you take natural gas off the table and don't consider it a clean fuel, the lights go out. So what I'm trying to do with the left is say, okay, let's have a rational transition here. Let's assume, let's understand that natural gas as a baseload fuel has to be part of the mix to a lower carbon economy. Should we have tariffs around till steel production? I think we should. I think that the practices of dumping steel by China and the way you make aluminum and all this other stuff, you need to build a car and other things, you have to level it out because the other side cheats. So what I see coming is a realization by the Republican Party that being uh, environmentally sensitive is good politics. I think you see a realization by the Democratic Party, big government, nanny government's being rejected. So there's a sweet spot here. Let's start with the border adjusted uh, tariffs. Let's see if we can build out the grid to accommodate the electric vehicle where we still use natural gas, wind, solar, all the above. And at the end of the day, uh, if you want to electrify the vehicle fleet, you better do something about power generation that makes logical sense, <clears throat> that doesn't turn the lights out, that still helps the environment. So it's a very complicated, interrelated uh, enterprise, but here's why I'm sort of hopeful. The most ardent climate change supporters realize you can't get there without some Republicans. And I think you're going to be amazed by President Trump being open-minded to alternative energy production. He'll be closed-minded about nanny government. But the idea of having a nuclear renaissance in America, we need to put that back on the table. We had two power plants we're trying to build in Georgia and South Carolina. We couldn't build either one of them. We got one of the three. The French do this, you know, just like making bagels, <laughs> which they don't make in France. So the bottom line is... Industrial revitalization is important, and if you don't have some protective elements around our industry, it's hard for them not to be shut out. So I'm not a protectionist. I'm a realist. If you manipulate your currency like they do with a wand, that's an unfair trade practice. One of the reasons Donald Trump is coming back and is doing well is most Americans believe that we've become chumps when it comes to trade. And Trump has a very simple idea. You put tariffs on my stuff, I'm going to put tariffs on your stuff. The world would be better off if we could lower tariffs, right? But until business practices become more standard, I think we have to fight to make sure our industrial capability is not destroyed, not for lack of, well, you know, smart people in America. We have plenty of hardworking, smart people because the other side cheats. Back to you, Morgan. 
Yeah, I, I mean, there's so much to um, unpack there. I think, you know, again, from a national security perspective, uh, when you look at this, you know, when we look at, for example, for energy, when we look at oil and gas exports, you know, I think a, a massive failure over the last couple of weeks, I think it happened at the end of January, beginning of February, is on the Friday afternoon when the Biden administration did the Friday news dump and said there would be no new exports of LNG. Um, and, and I again, I, I understand their North Star, climate change, they want to be effective. If, if not exporting LNG helped our friends, right, if it helped the United Kingdom, if it helped Canada, right? If, you know, if it helped any number of al allies around the world, okay, like maybe I could get around that. But, but again, just as an example from a security trade-off, not uh, exporting American LNG literally directly helps Russia, Iran, and other enemy states of the United States. Uh, and all it does, this, this policy, all it does is strengthen the Chinese Communist Party. And so, again, whenever we're looking at, at these trade-off decisions, whether it's, you know, what we do about LNG, if we're not increasing capacity here at home, or if we're not uh, helping an ally directly, and if our decision in the name of climate change is actually helping the Chinese Communist Party, helping the Russians, helping the Iranians, while we're in the middle and involved in wars with them, that's just not a sound policy for me. So that's more of like a, a context of how I think that we'll be looking at it potentially in a second Trump term. I also think when it comes to critical minerals and mining, every permit that's out for them that should be approved tomorrow. We don't have 10 years to wait, right? In 10 years time, the Chinese obviously already dominate those markets. If we don't start doing this at home, and I think what I'm saying here will be variations on a theme in the Trump administration. So uh, in, in my line of work, in my area of expertise in the military, uh, we have a massive problem being unable to, for example, uh, build the ships and build the submarines that we need. We can't even live up to our AUKUS commitments. We just sent over a military budget yesterday, a DOD budget that has us down to what, one submarine next year? That doesn't fulfill our own requirements, much less those of those that we've committed to in AUKUS. So, um, we have, for the last 30 years, 40 years in this country, decided to hand things off in the name of globalization uh, to China and to other countries, um, and some of them who very much view us as the enemy, things like our critical minerals and mining, our shipbuilding capacity. Uh, we are woefully unprepared from that perspective if we get in the middle, God forbid, if there is a military incursion uh, over Taiwan, even our pharmaceuticals, we're still getting about 90% of our generics from China. So I bring up all of these various industries because I think, again, that it's all variations on a theme of how we will look at EVs, how we will look at energy, how we will look at social media, how we will look at Huawei, 5G. I mean, it, it's almost sector agnostic. We're looking at it from a perspective, does this strengthen China, Russia, and Iran? If so, we think the policy is stupid, and we're going to be pursuing policies that strengthen the United States. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Senator Graham, uh, you, you talked about uh, uh, Donald Trump's kind of focus on, on the Midwest, on industrialization, on, on making sure that tariffs uh, uh, kind of level the playing field. And I think it's fair to say that, that he has pivoted American policy in a way that both parties have moved. Uh, you know, he won in 2016 because he won Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. And, and, and made the difference, and, and his insight was focusing on the sense of a hollowed out Midwest. And, and there's no question that, that Joe Biden um, embraced much of that theory and, and built on it. So he took the focus on the Midwest and said, I wanna build vehicles, I wanna build green vehicles, I wanna build those green vehicles with union labor. But, so that's, that's, that was the refinement from the Biden perspective. Uh, so what we'll see, no matter who wins, is it's a decade of, of a different point of view about globalism and about the virtues of, of, of leveling the playing field with tariffs. And I, I'm, I'm curious if, if you think this is a generational difference or if this is a moment that, that, will, that will go back to a more globalist perspective in, say, five years or 10 years. You know, it's a really good question because uh, globalization to a lot of uh, middle-class Americans seems to have been a net loser. Now, what I'm, what I'm trying to tell people back home, the world is interconnected whether you like it to be or not. So 
When you withdraw from Afghanistan, a place most people will never go, does it really matter? Yes, if people who take over Afghanistan want to kill you. Does it matter uh, if we sort of sell out Ukraine? Yes, because the other bad guys will take stuff they want, like Taiwan. So from a national security perspective, everything is interrelated. A strong America with good allies standing up to bad people, bad guys, is a good thing. You kill Soleimani, the Iranians go back in uh, a box. You give them money, they come out of the box. So how many times do we have to learn if you withdraw, ISIS comes back, Al-Qaeda comes back, and you have to go back in and kill them all over again? You got to understand your, your adversary. Radical Islam, you may be tired of fighting them, they're not tired of fighting you. You will fight them over there or they will come here and fight you. I choose to fight them over there, Morgan, with allies, not by ourselves. I per, I, I'd like to do it with a small American force, not 100,000. That's the world we live in. So globalization and isolationism are first cousins. So what you got to do is make sure that you make the global argument that evil will move forward if it's not checked, at the same time telling people it's okay to protect your own backyard. That's a bit hard to do. Here's the question. What if China did not cheat so rap uh, rampantly? What if they didn't manipulate the currency or steal our intellectual property and do all the things they're doing? The world would be better. Globalization would go down better. The WTO is a rules-based organization. China's in it, but they don't abide by it. So here's what I think my generation of pol political leaders have to do. Convince people America has to be involved in the world. We have to lead from the front, not the rear. That we have to be the arsenal of democracy to protect ourselves. Because the enemies of our way of life are not going to stop by putting your head in the sand. So i got to sell that. A strong military. Ford deployed. The border is your last line of defense, not your first line of defense. If they get to our border, we've screwed up. We should have gotten them before they got here. And at the same time, try to tell the business community and our allies that when it comes to feeding ourselves and arming ourselves and, you know, providing uh, medicine to ourselves, that we're going to have to protect our industries from forces who do not play by the global rules. Those are two things going on at once. And here's my big fear, that anti-globalization will lead to isolation. Does that make sense to you? We cannot let that happen. Come into that. Morgan, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to go after them. Um, I would think from a, you know, again, from a consumer perspective, people who lean politically right, I think I would just end by saying that they can be convinced to buy EVs, but that is the, not the job of the federal government. I think that's the job of auto manufacturers to market. I'm driving, even though I don't like to drive, I'm driving a hybrid right now, and I quite enjoy not having to go you to You really can't drive. It's not a joke. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> It's true. Um, uh, but, re re you know, consumers, Republican consumers, people right of sender can be convinced to buy EVs. And I don't think a Republican message that EVs are bad is, is what we're looking for. I don't think that's the intent at all. I do think the intent is to say whether it is EVs, social media, ports, uh, pharmaceuticals, ships, submarines, you name it, anything that is making us more dependent on the Chinese Communist Party is something, is a policy that President Trump's first national security team, and, and if he were to win his second national security team, I think would look at. So if I were in business, I'd be listening to Goldman Sachs, right, who has said recently that they don't see China as being an, a, a safe and investable place right now. If I were American corporations, I would not look to double down in selling my widgets in China. If I were an American consulting company or an American, you know, uh, somebody who's a, an investor, right? I would not be investing my pension fund in China. I would not be consulting with the Chinese Communist Party right now. You're seeing the China committee, uh, bipartisan committee uh, led by Mike Gallagher. We all know the companies that they have named that they're going after. And it's important to remember that uh, there's no such thing as a private sector in China. Those companies are beholden to the Chinese Communist Party. This is the big fight that we're having over 
uh, over TikTok. Right now, we had it over Huawei in the Trump administration. There was not a single meeting around the world that I was in with Secretary Mike Pompeo, not a single meeting, friend or foe alike, where he didn't bring up Huawei and the threat of authoritarian 5G. And I would just conclude by saying, I think that's the variation on the theme here today. Uh, De-risk from China uh, and be very wary and cognizant of um, policies that would make not only make us more dependent on China, but that would embolden Russia and Iran like the anti-LNG policy has done recently. Are we, I, I don't see a clock here. So team, do we have time for one more question or are we at our closure? We can talk about anything. <laughs> so why don't, why don't we, if we can, if we've got a little bit of time. I don't want to violate the Geneva Convention yeah. by holding these people against their will too. <laughs> so um, how about TikTok? So there's a big vote today. Uh, yeah, big vote. So this, I mean, all, it all like comes together, right? How many of you use TikTok? How many of you have kids that They're use all too TikTok? old to use TikTok. How many of you want to be able to live in your house peacefully? So, <laughs> so this is like a dilemma. I'm not a TikTok guy, but a lot of people <laughs> are. So how do you protect the data? The algorithms are in China. As long as the Chinese control the algorithms, the data makes no sense without algorithms, right? You've got to take the data and turn it into something that's meaningful. So I think uh, a sale is probably coming. I don't want to ban the app because a lot of people enjoy it. I don't want to get in, into that space unless we have to. But the national security concerns about China having access to the data, about how they can manipulate elections and all that kind of stuff through TikTok is real. So let me just end it with this. If you're into electric cars, South Carolina is like doing our fair share and then some. Mandate as Morgan said, not good. But if you really want to have an electric fleet, we gotta do something on power generation. And if you really want to have an electric fleet that's not dependent completely on China, we better start thinking about how you make batteries here and with our allies. So to those who are in this space, I'd like to work with you to come up with a way to increase generation of power that's environmentally friendly because if you don't do that, then electric vehicles are all talk. And if we don't find a way to make batteries, we're, we're not totally beholding on China for the processing and the minerals, then we've done ourselves more harm than good. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks, Senator. So Morgan, you get the final word. What is you want it to be on, TikTok? Or Whatever you want to talk about. It's uh -oh, your, that's the floor dangerous. is yours. <laughs> um, I mean, listen, I think, Again, from my national security perspective, uh, we, in early 2017, uh, we had spent at that point 15, 17 years of uh, almost 20 years of war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And all of us on the national security side um, were, we had done multiple tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, diplomats, military, intel people. Uh, we had spent, you know, 15 years focused on counterterrorism and counterinsurgency. Uh, the national security strategy that was written in 2017 by Trump's team, they did a fantastic job. Um, and they clearly tried to shift the United States policy towards geopolitical political competition, whatever you want to call it, um, between China and Russia and the United States. And President Biden's team, I think to their credit, actually took a lot of those policies and themes. They may have changed the word and call it integrated deterrence now. It means the same thing, essentially. It's just a new word because, because it's a new team. Um, but that is the that is the context, that is the lens, that's the policy perspective by which that we're going to make uh, all decisions. Um, whether it's, and by the way, I don't think this is just a Trump thing. I think if you go and talk to most Republican senators or the other guys uh, and ladies that were running for president, uh, that is where the Republican Party is headed uh, writ large. So um, I, I guess that's kind of the theme that, that I want to hammer in is, is holistically how we view uh, the threat from the Chinese Communist Party in, in all sectors. And I think the final thing that I would say is if you really care about EVs, um, stop, stop making them a culture war thing, 
right? That doesn't help anything. Everything, even freaking Bud Light got to be a part of the culture wars. And whenever you make a product that I think is actually crucial uh, for consumer choice, crucial to the American economy, we, we have to get EVs right. And whenever people start putting them into the context of the culture wars, and, if, and it's just a losing strategy for EV makers in general. Fair enough. Don't have a, don't drink Bud Light while you're driving the EV. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a great final word. So Senator Graham, uh, Morgan, thank you for sharing thank your you. insights and giving us a clue about how the world will change if, uh, if Donald Trump is elected president. So thank you. Thanks.